Good evening, everyone joining us here in Malaysia, and a special hello to everyone else tuning in from different parts of the world. My name is Duncan Kaye from the Think City Institute, and welcome to the first in the series of webinars, Dollars and Cents, which are an introduction to the conservation and economics of our shared cultural heritage. These are a result of a collaboration between Think City Institute and Ecomos Malaysia, uh, sorry, Ecomos Malaysia's Emerging Professionals Group. So this series is here with a purpose. Ecomos and Think City Institute have teamed up to develop an online course, which is being very kindly supported by a grant from the City Foundation. So do stay tuned in, as I'll be giving you more details about that um, at the end of the session. And there's actually an opportunity for you to be one of the first people to apply for the course. So our partner, Ecomos Malaysia, works for the conservation and protection of cultural heritage places. It's the local chapter of the only global non-governmental organization of this kind, which is dedicated to promoting the application of theory, methodology, and scientific techniques to the conservation of the architectural and archeological heritage. As a network of experts, it benefits from the interdisciplinary exchange of its members, which includes architects, historians, archeologists, art historians, geographers, anthropologists, engineers and town planners. The members of ECOMOS contribute to improving the preservation of heritage, the standards and the techniques for each type of cultural heritage property, buildings, historic cities, cultural landscapes and archaeological sites. Think City Institute is a knowledge repository and capacity building organization based here in Malaysia with a focus on solving urban issues, making our cities more livable, more sustainable and more resilient. So while we're based here in Malaysia, we see ourselves as regional in outlook, looking to solve those problems that plight our cities, but through a Southeast Asian lens. We work with international and regional organizations to bring best practice and new solutions to our city makers in the region. Before we start our session, uh, let me give you some basic housekeeping. Our format will be a presentation by our speaker, followed by a Q&A session. And there's going to be plenty of opportunity to ask questions. And you can do so in the chat box that you see at the side of your screen. Even if you don't have a question, please join the conversation and tell us where you're listening in from. And before we go, um, before we go on, if you are having connection problems, click the reconnect button at the top of the page. And if you still have problems, then try refreshing your browser and you're going to be brought back into the room. So I'd like to invite my good friend, Mariana Issa from Ecomos Malaysia's Developing Professionals Group to moderate tonight's talk. Mariana is an architect, historian, and author who has played an important role, I think, in bringing our shared heritage to people's attention with her books, her city walks, and her talks. Her books include The Towns of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur Street Names, and Between the Bay of Bengal and the Java Sea. She is a co-founder of Heritage Output Lab, and somehow she still finds the time to be the Honorary Secretary of Ecomos Malaysia. Good evening, Mariana. Thanks for moderating. Doctor. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't expect that. <laughs> Please, uh, over to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, this is actually our first um, collaboration with Think City Institute, and we are super grateful for the opportunity. I am very um, excited and proud to introduce our speaker uh, for today. Um, Shaiful Lizon Shahidan is um, also our Assistant Honorary Secretary uh, for ECOMOS Malaysia. Um, he is one of Malaysia's upcoming archaeologists. Um, his background is, a, he has a background in anthropology, but he's been working full time um, as an archaeologist at the Center for Global Archaeological um, Research. Um, at, at USM. Um, and for the past 10 years, he's been working at most of Malaysia's uh, uh, major archaeological sites um, involved in the excavation and research at Sungai Batu, uh, Lengong, uh, Guokapa, Fort Ponwales, and Siaboy. Um, and um, his focus, his research, research focus right now is the uh, is at Guokapa, right, uh, Shaifu? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm gonna just slot in because I, I I told him that I'll tell everyone that he's my best friend. So there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hand over the session to you, and I'll see you at the Q and A slot. All right. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Mariana. 
Um, okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Shaiful Shahidan. I'm from the Center for Global Archaeological Research, University of Science Malaysia. Uh, currently a PhD student as well as a fellow uh, looking at uh, the study of one of the sites that I'm going to be presenting uh, today, which is Kua Kepa. So um, in this uh, talk, I'm just going to talk about the urban archaeology in Penang, uh, as well as uh, semi-urban archaeology, which is in Guarkapa, because, you know, Penang is divided into two um, areas, right? Okay, so uh, briefly about archaeology in Penang, uh, its first archaeological evidence recorded in 1840 by Colonel James Lowe, uh, British, by the British, on the inscription at Chirot Tokun in Sebrang Parai. Uh, the inscription itself can be dated far back to 4th century AD, and then there's an also another inscription, Budagutta inscription, uh, dated no later than 5th century. So most of the early archaeological records were basically uh, were mainly on, on uh, inscriptions. And then uh, Mokhtar Saidin also recorded in his papers about several findings of Neolithic Aces in the current site of Komtar, uh, in Sungai Ara, in Glugor. There were some reports of people finding uh, old stone tools as well as the Aceh gravestone or the Nisan Aceh at Muka, Mukahit in Teluk Pahang. So in terms of the records, uh, the material records uh, is already there in Penang. So my, um, sorry, okay. So this map shows the location of Penang in Peninsula of Malaysia, the red colored dot, as well as most of the majority of the sites that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, so for today's presentation, I'm just going to focus on the sites in the Georgetown 2-3, as well as the site number 4, which is Guarkapa. So uh, 2 and 3 is uh, urban sites, and 4 is considered as uh, semi-urban sites in Guarkapa. So um, it, the presentation will be divided into three sections. So I'm just going to go for Fort Cornwallis and then move on to um, Siaboy, as well as the last part would be on Guarkapa. So Fort Cornwallis is, uh, as you might know, is one of the uh, popular destinations in Penang. If you come to Penang, you might be visiting Fort Cornwallis. It's a, it's, it's, it's a must place to visit. So uh, another map of Penang. And then uh, it's located in Padang Kota Lama, or the Esplanade, uh, the old names. And uh, the green area is the core zone of the World Heritage Site, Georgetown World Heritage Site, while the red colored is actually the buffer zone of the World Heritage Site. So the location of Padang Kota Lama is where uh, the Fort Cornwallis is situated now. So in terms of the, just want to give you a brief idea about major historical periods of Penang. Penang is uh, an, uh, an island that was um, first, well, it was occupied by mostly by the Malay village under Sultan of Kedah. In 1786, East India Company came in, Francis Light landed in 17 July, and then uh, the rest is more or less history. I mean, the British government uh, occupied the state uh, during the World War II, the Japanese occupation, uh, and then the, pres the present, at the present time, you know, uh, the, the, the current independent Malaysia. So this is a aerial view of the fort, uh, looking, uh, overlooking the, the rest of the uh, city area, Georgetown. So we've been doing work here since uh, 2016, 2017. So the, the, the name comes from uh, after the then Lieutenant General, the second Earl Cornwallis, uh, he was the Governor General of Bengal during the time of construction. Uh, and Fort Cornwallis is a type of bastion fort uh, where you can actually see it's very common uh, after the 15th century, uh, but it was first uh, developed and built in Italy, in Europe. And currently, Fort Cornwallis is the largest standing fort in Malaysia with a size of 418 square feet. So when English East India Company landed in seven, on 17th of July, 1786, that was the first time when the Union flag was raised uh, uh, in, in Penang. So uh, that marked 
the beginning of the British uh, occupation or the British um, uh, presence in, in Peninsular Malaysia. So one of the old maps of the uh, uh, Penang or Georgetown is 1799, a proper map. You can actually see the outlines of the fort quite, cl quite clearly. So it means when they actually landed, they haven't built the fort yet, but uh, after a while, so they started to build a fortification and around the area, you can actually see Malay villages and Malay town and some other um, uh, features like paddy fields and et cetera. So this is kind of like a rough timeline that I got from the CMP of Fort Cornwallis uh, Conservation Management Plan. So July 1793, Francis Light started building uh, bricks for the fort. And in 1804, uh, uh, Robert uh, Fakuha, I mean, the one that replaced Francis Light, started to did a major upgrade on Fort Cornwallis. And in 1812, uh, there was an escalation, uh, a, a war between Britain and America. So they decided to fortify the fort by installing more cannons and mortars. But in 1881, um, when there wasn't any need, there wasn't any threat, a real threat anymore. So the fort was decommissioned. It became a, a ruins and not an army building anymore. During the pre-World War I, uh, they decided in 1912 to demolish the fort because uh, there was no use and then um, uh, there is a need for space in terms of uh, uh, it's located right by the port and they need an, an area to actually uh, um, build more warehouse and more buildings to support the trade, the trading during that time. And to facilitate the demolition in 1922, the moat was filled up to assist the demolition. Unfortunately, um, the World War II came, uh, and be right before the World War II, 1935, they decided not to demolish. And then the World War II came in, the Japanese occupied the fort and um, used it as a base. Uh, and then it survived as it is until now. If not because of the World War II, I mean, we don't really see the fort nowadays. In 1977, it was declared as national monument. In 2007, it became the World Heritage. I mean, Georgetown became the World Heritage Site. And we started our first archaeological or maybe the second archaeological excavation in 2017. So just to give you a rough idea, this is when they actually, uh, when they started building the fort, you can actually all see the Nibong stockade, the wooden um, stockade used as the uh, wall for the fort. And when the Robert Fakuha came in, so uh, they upgrade the Nibong uh, into a, a tube uh, using a brick, and but still using a Nibong parapet. So there, there's an extensive upgrade and modifications on the fort. So uh, based on the CMP again from Fort Convalis, you can actually see the evolution of it uh, from time from 1781 until the current era. So there's so many modifications. I mean, buildings has been built and then torn down and then replaced with something else. So Fort it has been used quite extensively uh, for different purposes and the different uh, reasons. Some of the materials used, uh, Timber, which is, uh, they use it from Nibong palm, which is quite common in the area. Clay and bricks, uh, locally produced. There are also clay and bricks imported from uh, other parts of the country. Stones, uh, lime, iron and cement, as well as jaggery sugar. This is another uh, postcard uh, looking at the view uh, of the fort uh, in 1804. And a map of a fort by 1893. This is one of the uh, complete map called Kelly's map uh, produced uh, during that time. So that gives a very good scale as well as a very detailed description of all the buildings within the fort. As I've mentioned earlier, in 1921, they started to fill up the moat. So this is a picture in 1905 when the moat are still active as part of the defense. 
So the old pictures on the left side, 1869, the southern moat. And this is the picture from 2016 when you can actually see the moat has been filled up. And um, function, I mean, part of this southern moat was used as a car park right before the excavation. Again, another perspective of the eastern moat. Um, overlooking at the back there is actually the clock tower. And then this is the northern moat uh, facing the sea. Um, there was like a, a couple of uh, theory, a couple of rumors saying that there used to be a tunnel from the inside the fort towards the sea as part of a secret tunnel. But when we did the GPR, we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't find any tunnel. Um, southern moat and the eastern moat, uh, another as angle of it where the car, the car park used to be. Uh, again, sorry. So this is um, what we have, I'm going into what we have conducted so far. Um, in 2020, uh, January 2020, you can actually see the, uh, the, the fort, uh, the car park has been, well, it was closed earlier, but then uh, we started to do our excavation. And then uh, these are some of the components of the uh, fort and some of the other attractions uh, that you can see in the fort. I mean, uh, for those who has visited, you can actually see all this, except that you cannot enter the lighthouse and flag stuff because it's a restricted area, but you can still take pictures of most of the structures and you know um, um, uh, features uh, inside the fort. So our project involves, with Think City as well as CMI, uh, involves in terms of the excavation of uh, the southern moat, uh, to restore the southern moat and uh, to expose the uh, the area in front of the storage room. So uh, because the area 1A and 2A is one of the lowest area within the fort. So when there was like flood, a big flooding event, so this this area was usually flooded to the up to the uh, up to the thigh level. So it's, it's quite hard to actually conserve the uh, buildings, the storage room, without having a proper uh, drainage system inside uh, this area. So um, Think City and CMI decided to actually undertake a very uh, proper conservation uh, project, and we were tasked in to do the archaeological uh, study on this uh, uh, storage room as well as the um, uh, southern moat area. Uh, so first, we put up a grid in order to do a proper survey, as well as to um, help in terms of excavating systematically. And then uh, this is one of the first things that we have to do, mostly before we started excavation. Um, this is our, uh, G what we call GPR, ground penetrating radar. So people have been asking me, how do you actually know what's underneath the ground. Uh, yeah, we don't use black magic, so we use the machine, basically. So we scan things and then we can, then we know what, uh, what's actually, it gives, gives us an idea what to expect uh, underneath the ground. So we also overlapped the area, the aerial photo with the map that I've shown you earlier, the Kelly's map. So you can basically using a proper scale, you can actually expect what to find. Uh, for example, this gym khana, uh, the gentleman's club in front of it. And you can actually see all these foundations of the rooms. Once you dig up, you, you will definitely find it. So after um, working for about a year, uh, so we actually expose most of the uh, subsurface structures that has been buried for maybe more than 150 years, 200 years. Um, and then uh, it's, it's quite interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the, the structures. And then on the area 2A, you can actually see these uh, trolley tracks, uh, which was built by the Japanese. And uh, some of the uh, earlier British structures and um, uh, post-Japanese British structures as well. On the southern moat, we managed to found the outer moat wall as well as the inner moat wall. So the area within 
the outer and the inner walls was filled with water during that time, as you can see from the previous pictures that I've shown you. Uh, and we managed to, found, to find the glassy uh, wall as well, uh, which is the first line of defense uh, before you reach the outer mode wall. So another perspective of it, as you can see, uh, there's a quite interesting structures right in front of the barracks. And it's actually a Japanese trolley tracks that was built by the Japanese during the World War II when they occupied the fort. So uh, because, of the, uh, because of the location of this uh, fort, it's located right next to the port. Um, so they used the storage room to store things. And this part use, was uh, used as a support for the trading during the Japanese period. So you can actually see the trolley tracks leading straight into the each and each and single room, uh, which is um, uh, what we have found. So these are uh, the sleepers. So it was, it was actually built uh, by concrete and cement. So you can actually see, uh, still see the, the markings of the sleepers, uh, but the uh, the, the wooden uh, sleepers, uh, some of it survived and some uh, some are not, uh, some is not survived. So we found fragments of it. We have at this point of time, um, more than 10,000 artifacts has been catalogued. These are some of the artifacts, coins, uh, lots of glass fragments, uh, personal items such as clay pipe, um, stoneware, uh, bicycle parts. I think we have enough bicycles part to actually reconstruct a whole bicycle, uh, mostly by the Japanese. I think it's Japanese bicycle or British bicycle. Cannonball, keys, and many other interesting artifacts that we have never uh, expected to find, actually. Uh, quite interestingly, we have bags and bags of ammunition. Uh, most of it has been used. Some of it uh, still live ammunition, uh, and we know this uh, from from um, uh, talking to the army people who actually joined in the excavation as well to help and as well to learn. So we found lots of 7.62 mm uh, ammunition uh, could be dated to Japanese or uh, during the World War II period. And another thing is that we also found um, a cannon and a mortar buried in front of one of the room, uh, this one. So it's actually the long one is the cannon and the shorter one is actually the mortar. Well, the reason why they actually buried mortar and cannon right in front of this is part of the research question by one of our master's students. So she's actually working on it. There's a, a few theories, but we have no, we have, uh, we haven't found out uh, the, the, the exact reason why yet at this point. Uh, it could be discarded after the fort has been uh, decommissioned. So they just, you know, dump everything in and then just buried it. Um, but it's quite interesting to see this kind of uh, features being buried uh, within uh, the, the fort and in front of the, the room itself. So uh, on the other hand, in, uh, on the outside of the wall, uh, they, uh, um, the MPPP, the council, the Penang uh, council is also working on reinforcement of the seawall during the um, uh, reconstruction of the seawall. They also found uh, all these five uh, cannons, which is much bigger than the cannons that were found in front of the room number one. Uh, that has been used as a, a part of the, to strengthen the wall. So mean by, by the time they decommissioned the fort, maybe they don't know what to do with the cannons. So they just, you know, recycle it as part of the uh, <laughs> building materials for the, uh, for, for the wall, for the seawalls. So uh, when they actually dug up the seawall and trying to uh, um, rebuilding it, so they found five of these. Canon. It's currently being restored by the National Heritage Department, uh, and uh, it still can be seen. I mean, nowadays it's it's within the within the fort itself. And uh, 
uh, out of all this, I mean, uh, the research that we've been doing, um, it's not just complete research by itself. It's not just consultancy, but as well, we try to benefit uh, the locals, especially the school kids from 10 to 17. Uh, this is one of the initiatives by my colleague, uh, Dr. Go Xiaomi, the Young Archaeologist Program at Fort Convalis. So uh, we did a few sessions uh, within uh, uh, maybe twice a month uh, back in 2018, 2019. So we invited school children to come in and help us with the dig. Uh, we trained them, we actually actually tell them on how to do archaeology per se, uh, tell them as well, uh, teach them how to do analysis. And at the end of the session, we ask them to make a short presentation of how they feel and what they understand about Fort archaeology. It's quite refreshing, I mean, to get that kind of perspective from kids and from school children. So uh, this is a good program. And I think uh, we try to uh, do archaeological program as well as benefiting uh, the community within the site as well, within and around the site. The second archaeological um, site, so archaeological excavation that I'm going to share with you today is on Siaboy Archaeological Park. Um, uh, Siaboy is a Hokkien term for end of the town. As I've mentioned before, the red one is the core zone. The green one is actually the buffer zone. But uh, Siabo is located right outside of the buffer zone of uh, Georgetown World Heritage Site. So that's why, um, well, it's quite apt to, to say that it's the end of the town. It's, part, uh, it's very close to Komta. Uh, it's part of the uh, Komta fifth phase of the Komta development project. Uh, the whole area of Siaboy was uh, actually closed in 2004. Uh, but uh, for the Penangites, they know that Siaboy is uh, the, where the market is. Uh, the market was closed in uh, 2004 and it was relocated to Mecklenburg Street. Uh, but uh, based on the um, historical record, uh, the market was there at the beginning of 18. 19th century, 1806, there used to be some sort of market, but the real market was established in, sometimes in 1880s, uh, according to Marcus Langdon and uh, Gwyn Jenkins. Uh, the built heritage of Siabo is the tactile component holding of the diverse cultural, economic, and religious strands of the community in single social fabric. Uh, Siabo is quite important for uh, town people because it's where things are happening. Uh, um, I'm going to tell you, yeah, so uh, this is uh, on the right side, it's actually the market of Siaboy after it has been closed, and this is when it was on the left side, the picture is was when the, the, the area was still bustling and happening with uh, markets, or with uh, temporary stalls, and this area is very popular among the Penangites because it's located very strategically, uh, there's uh, entertainment parks and cinemas, nearby and it's one of the places where you can get food uh, um, around the clock. So uh, Siabo is one of the, uh, the, the places in Penang during that time. Old pictures of Prang Canal. So Siabo, uh, this is uh, looking back at the picture of the uh, market on this side, as you can see here, it's actually the Prangin Canal. It used to be a Sungai Prangin. So Sungai Prangin is one of the water body that runs through the town of Georgetown. So it's quite an important water body. So Prangin Canal uh, in 1800, 1900, and this is how it looks like before uh, the conservation uh, by, by the state government. So we were roped in to look at the archaeology of uh, Siaboy as well, uh, which is the old Prangin Canal and Site B uh, based on the map used to be uh, old police barrack. So uh, we did excavation in site A as well as site B. So site A, this is how it looks like. Uh, this is part of the old uh, uh, Prangin Canal uh, uh, wall basin. Uh, and then uh, the, the whole, uh, not a very um, pleasant site to work in because it's wet and it's very smelly. 
uh, the the Prangin Canal is like a big drain and it's a drain located right next to the market. So you can imagine what kind of things are there. So, um, but the, the in terms of the archaeology, in terms of the value, uh, I think it's very priceless. This is part of the basin wall, 45 meters wall that we have discovered. And uh, we can also tell the method of construction during that time because the whole area used to be a very swampy area. So before they built up the wall, they used the bakau or the nibung stilt as a foundation to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the granite wall, the granite stone can, uh, can stand firmly, um, um, especially in this kind of environment. So on the side of uh, site B, the old police barrack, we found um, a structure of the police barrack, as well as the modern structure. This is part of the uh, 1970s um, structure that they use uh, to, to kind of like guard the plant. So you have, you have like a, a circular thing within the plant. So you have the three roots, the old three roots in the middle, and then you have that uh, concrete structure. So you can actually see a series of um, um, a structure or elements on top of one another. So the brick structure is about 1800s, early, early 1900s. Uh, and uh, on top of it is 1917 structure. So it's quite interesting to see. And uh, but we managed to ex uh, expose certain part of the police barrack. Uh, but then uh, within the site, it's actually quite a big site, but uh, we didn't manage to expose the whole thing because of the space limitation. So um, when they actually, when they have uh, exposed, when we expose everything, so the plan is that GTWHI uh, actually prepared a Siaboy um, uh, heritage uh, plan, management plan, an uh, integrated management plan. And now it's actually open to public. So if you come to Penang next time, you can actually uh, take a walk at Siaboy Archaeological Park. It's, uh, it's one of, uh, it's quite nice park. I mean, a green uh, pocket park in, in the middle of the city. And you can actually see that the canal has been restored uh, there's fishes and then there's also playground for kids uh, to play and uh, the, the idea as well is to leave that police barrack sites open for uh, a kind of uh, young archaeological program at Siaboy so people, uh, school kids and children can come back and then uh, do a series of more excavation, archaeological excavation on, on real site active uh, values uh, to, to the public as well. The second, the third site that I'm going to present uh, today is on Guar Kepah Um This is actually one of the, uh, this is much earlier sites in Penang. I think this is considered as the oldest site in Penang, to be honest, uh, from the Neolithic site. Just now I was talking about all the historical sites, I mean, the British sites, uh, the uh, Fort Cornwallis and uh, Siaboy, but now we're going back uh, uh, 3,000, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, well, about 3,000 years, uh, sorry, 5,000 years ago in Guarcapa, Panaga. So Guarcapa is located right uh, next, uh, very close to Sungai Muda, which is uh, the water body that actually becomes a, uh, um, um, a divider between Kedah and Penang. Uh, and uh, it is recorded uh, that there are three sites, uh, the three sites in Guacapa, site A, site B, and site C, but uh, only site B survive today, while site C and site A uh, is not uh, there already. Uh, I will tell you later why. So Guacapa is actually a shell maiden site. So what is a shell maiden? It's a cultural deposit in which particles of animal shell are the dominant class of refuse, a cultural deposit of which the principal visible constituent shell, and then it could be a secondary deposit site uh, because there's a lot of shells. So people asking like, what, 
what what happened to the shells because people eat it and they throw it at one place um, and then becomes a median, a small hill. And then a more complex sites indicate other behaviors in addition to consumption. Uh, complex uh, behaviors, uh, complex sites uh, signifies behaviors such as uh, burials, and then they use uh, shells, uh, maiden as something else, not just a, uh, as a, uh, the place where they discard all the shells, but also use it as a burial site. So this is the common practice, not just in Malaysia, but all over the world during the Neolithic period. There's still shell maidens all over the world in Africa, uh, in, in you can find shell maiden sites in, in, in many countries in, in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, in Philippines, uh, and it displays the same kind of uh, behavior. So they throw things there. They also bury humans in within the shell maiden site. So this is what we found in Guarkpa uh, in Penaga. Uh, and Guarkpa is not is not a new site. It has been researched back in 1851, mostly by the British. Uh, and they found lots of human skeletons, maybe not in complete form, but uh, part of it. And then uh, the focus when it comes to the Guacapa is always on the human remains of, of, of the old people, of the Neolithic people that was buried within the Shell Middens. And uh, um, after 19, after independence in 1994, then the local archaeologists uh, started to show interest in doing research in Guacapa. Hakimi did that in 1994, and then Bullback, Fu, and Mokhtar Saidin in 2010. So this is surveillance excavation by Mokhtar in 2008. Uh, as you can see, I mean, the one the area where the trees are is used to be a huge shell median so you can actually estimate how big the area was so uh, when Mokhtar did a survey in 2008 you can still find lots of uh, shells as part of the shell median so it was recorded by the british when they first arrived there uh, the the median itself is 22 feet high so during the um the industrial pre period in Penang, um, they also recorded that there's a lot of Chinese coolies actually excavating these medians and take out the limes to use as a lime for construction building. So that's how it, it, it got disappeared. So as I mentioned earlier, site A and site C has been you know, excavated and used as a lime to build a house or building in Penang. So the only one that survived, well, not to say survived completely, but survived uh, so that we can do research is a site B. So when Mokhtar did uh, sampling and sent it to, to, to a certified uh, dating lab in America, so the dating came back as 5,680 BP. That's about uh, the right time for Neolithic occupation of the site. So this is when we did excavation. Uh, so uh, part of the systematic excavation. So we don't really dig out the whole site, but you know, uh, using a, a set of uh, different kind of sampling method. Uh, so uh, and based of that, based on those excavation in two thousand and ten, we found uh, bones, mostly animal bones, uh, stone tools, uh, shells, of course, obviously, and then um, on on the records. Uh, by the previous researchers, the British mostly, when they actually took out, uh, when they actually uh, analyzed all the um, uh, human remains found, they discovered that 178 teeth, uh, out of 178 teeth analyzed, 93% were stained red beetle chewing. So, uh, makan siri or beetle chewing is not uh, is a very old tradition that can be dated back to the Neolithic period, and this is also the similar custom uh, based on the evidence found on the human skeletons from Klantan as well in Pralin Cave. It's quite interesting to note that this is a a, a, a very uh, unique tradition. Uh, uh, 
not just not just in but not just in Guakapa, but you know throughout the region as well, and throughout Peninsula Malaysia. So in 2017, uh, when the government decided, when the state government decided that, oh, okay, because this is a quite important site, I think we should build up a gallery here. So when we were working on the, on clearing the area, uh, you know, uh, doing some kind of rescue archaeology, we discovered that the, the, the mound are still intact underground. And then some part of it uh, where we actually found uh, skeletons, human, real human skeletons. So Guarcapa, uh, based on the previous research, uh, they have discovered 41 human skeletons. Uh, and all these 41 skeletons are currently now in uh, Leiden, uh, in Netherlands. Uh, well, during that time, it's quite common for our artifacts to be brought back overseas. Uh, so this is number 42. So we found the number 42 skeletons in the country, and that's the only Guarcapa skeleton in the country. So the skeleton is uh, actually extended burial, uh, and uh, based on the previous research, uh, most of the uh, researchers and archaeologists think that uh, Guarcapa is actually, uh, because it's a shell maiden site, so it's not uh, primary burial means they don't really bury it there, they bury it somewhere else and then put it in the midden. But based on skeleton number 42 or GKH uh, 2017, uh, we discovered that actually they purposely actually buried people there uh, in an extended burial. Means um, they, they, it's not flex, but they, they, they put uh, uh, a proper burial for a person. Uh, with a clear association of all the other remains like pottery, stone tools, and shells uh, as a burial goods. So this is quite an uh, important um, evidence of uh, burial in, in shell meeting in Malaysia. And north-south orientation is also quite a popular uh, uh, type of uh, burial, especially during that time. So for Guacapa site, current knowledge, uh, we know that uh, based on the data that have been gathered since 1851, we know that people in Guacapa, uh, they adapt uh, within the marine because it's located very close to the river and as well as not far from the sea. So they eat uh, marine and as well as terrestrial animals. Uh, pig and deer is uh, quite their favorite because we found lots of those kind of skeletons during the excavation. They collect shells, they eat shells. They are the beetle nut chewers based on the evidence of their teeth. Uh, they utilize pottery, uh, which is common during the Neolithic period. Uh, that's also one of the signifiers of Neolithic. When you talk about Neolithic, you know, you talk about pottery. The burial is extended. Uh, if you know about Perak Man, Perak Man was buried in a flex position like a baby when they were born and then they were born in a flex position. When they were given back to the afterlife, they will also be sent back in a flex position, but it's not the case with Guacapa. So now it's, it's actually extended burial. And uh, we know as well, uh, based on the evidence, there's a lot of stone tools, uh, unifacial, bifacial, a type of knife during that time because they don't have metal yet. So they fashion stone, stones, various stones to become a different kind of stone tools. So uh, interestingly about Guacapa, so if you, um, maybe you're in Penang and if you want to go to Kedah, you can take, a, instead of taking the highway, you can take a scenic route uh, through the paddy field, uh, and before crossing the Sungai Muda, you will pass through Gallery Guacapa. It's open every day from 8 to 5, so you can just drop by. There's no fees, no charge. You can actually go and see uh, this gallery as well as the artifacts and uh, things there. Um, one thing I note, uh, one thing I would like to note about this Guacapa, uh, besides all these uh, simple uh, temporary exhibitions that we have set up together with CMI, Chief Minister Incorporated, is that uh, in July 2015, well, this is an old picture. I just want to give you uh, a, a brief comparison. Um, before this, before we started the excavation and before we did research but proper, before the gallery was established, there's nothing there. Basically, it's just an old kampong area, old village area. 
But uh, in 2019, uh, right in front, right opposite of this entrance, you know, right opposite of this entrance, you can actually find uh, a restaurant. Uh, so the locals actually uh, came up with the initiative to open up restaurant. And now it's uh, called the Medan Slayer de Museum. And you can actually see people flocking the area. Um, and then, you know, uh, this is, I think, one of the um, um, the effects of the, the trickle effect of uh, archaeology and research on how uh, conservation and preservation of a site can contribute to the local economy indirectly or directly. So this is uh, uh, apart from the academic values that we got uh, in, the, in this kind of semi-urban or rural areas, uh, there's also economic, economic as well as uh, other social values that can be promoted as well. So moving forward, out of all this, I mean, to, to link back to the theme of dollar and cents, uh, when you talk about the archaeology as well as the conservation and preservation, I think it's quite important to, to bridge the past and present, uh, but by developing the awareness and link it through proper understanding and cooperative efforts, especially among the, the, the key holders, the, the stakeholders, uh, researchers, uh, the government, as, but most importantly, the community. Um, the top-down approach, I mean, we're in Malaysia, is very common. I mean, the government say something and then you, the government expect that the, the people will follow. It should be replaced with the bottom-up approach, which is, uh, I think, personally, much more uh, sustainable in the long run uh, for the conservation and preservation of sites. Um, the it and I can I concur with Pocotillo and Gapi when they talk about conservation effort as the improvement of the general level of public knowledge about archaeology and the demonstration of the benefits of archaeology to society. Uh, overall, I th think archaeological and heritage education is the key to strike a balance between the need to be a developed nation and the obligation to preserve um, and create sustainable stewardship towards heritage among the local community. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your time. I would like to say thank you to uh, Think City Institute, uh, Ecomos Malaysia, uh, the CMI, uh, Chief Minister Incorporated, uh, GTWHI as well as USM Center for Global Archaeological Research uh, for, for, for giving me the opportunity to work on this kind of project and to share it with you tonight. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm open for Q&A session. Hi, hi. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> thank you so much, Saiful. You know what? If it weren't for sharing sessions like this, we would never get to know about what's going on in the local archaeological scenes, all the discoveries and all the uh, mysteries you've solved. Um, and I, I do feel like I, I wish all this information um, is made available in a more friendly manner, you know, like how um, other more advanced countries, you know, they, they, they get support from the film industry. There are so many, yeah. you know, high, good, good quality documentaries um, and um, even what do you call that? That um, you know, the, the, you know, on Facebook you get all these feeds. You know, oh, uh, yeah. someone you know they discovered a Egyptian mosaic underneath. Yeah. Uh, you know, six meter underneath, and so and so wherever. Uh, and and yeah. the information is spread out, is shared fast. You know, it doesn't take yeah. to share that info. You know, so, so we're all the information from other countries are more current compared to ours. This is what I I feel. Um, but um, I, I, I really think all your good work needs much more support from <laughs> the other industries. And um, you, you put all, you know, that we, I can see you have a lot of passion in your job. Um, this is not just uh, bread and butter for you. It's really what you believe in. And, you know, it's, and I know, I know, I know you personally, and you're always 
eager and um, willing to share your knowledge. Um, and um, well, I'm gonna stop blabbing. Let's see what questions you have. Um, from, well, they're all saying that you, you gave a very interesting talk. Uh -huh. <laughs> so from Martina, uh, from Martina, she asked, what has been the response of the local communities to these archeological excavations? Um, it's always interesting for, for us is, um, you know, I, I just want to share. I mean, um, I was involved in the Lengong, uh, Lengong Valley's uh, World Heritage Site nomination. Um, and USM has been working in Lengong for more than 30 years. So when, when um, Lengong was inscribed into the World Heritage Site, so the first thing that uh, we are interested to know is how the local communities react to it. Uh, they are very happy, uh, but then it became a, a kind of a slow in terms of the development of the site itself. So we learn from that, and we think that uh, when we work on site, apart from the archaeology, apart from the data that we got, we also have to think of the local. So uh, we always engage with the locals by uh, and by roping them as part of our excavation team and then uh, they're always amazed on the works and not just the work that we are doing but the things that they found underground you know they've been living there for their life and they say oh wow this is wonderful uh, majority of the locals are very uh, welcoming of this new knowledge uh, but then it needs to be you know uh, put it in a very uh, a good balance because there's a lot of challenges nowadays. Um, recently in Para, for example, you have locals who are kind of like aware of all the things that they found in the cave. Uh, awareness itself, if you don't manage it properly, it can harm you back. For example, if they know uh, they found an artifact and if they associate the artifact with money, the only thing that they can think of the artifact is how, how to sell it. So that's not what you're supposed to do with artifacts. I mean, you don't really sell it. You have to appreciate it and then, you know, uh, benefit from it uh, intrinsically, not just by uh, economically, uh, I mean, by selling it. So yeah. this kind of information uh, with the locals, you need to, to, to strike a balance. Yeah, so uh, we, they have to understand, or we have to educate, and or you have to educate them on. Uh, yeah, but we have to learn. What is valuable? That goes yeah. back to our question about dollars yeah. and cents and cultural yeah. heritage. In, in the sense of Sia Boy, for example, I think uh, as an archaeologist, I think I still remember my colleague, Dr. Go Xiaomi, um, we're talking about how the locals should, could actually uh, give input to the archaeological um, uh, um, uh, story storyline. Because when ar we archaeologists do things, I mean, um, sometimes we found things that we don't really know. So the locals... Uh, always uh, can can ha somehow help to give input. Oh, this is these are the things that I've I've seen. You know, I know someone who's been uh, displaying this kind of ceramics in their house. So um, the locals are very much excited about the the excavation and the archaeological discovery as well. Okay, well that brings us to there are two related questions. One from Gwyn and one from Amira. Gwyn says uh, at Gorkapa, um, there was a house uh, and a family right next to the midden and they were, um, were they involved in the excavation and is their house still there? Wow. Amira, Amira's query is, you know, what happens if the excavation site needs to be extended horizontally and it encroaches into personal properties? Okay, um, I want to answer the fire, same. Um, yeah, the the rules, the government regulations okay. on land, and so, so the on. Second, the second question first. Um, uh, uh, to do archaeological excavation, you need to apply a proper license from the Department of National Heritage. One of the most important requirements, is number one requirement, is to get uh, a permission from the landowner before you can start the excavation. If there's no permission from the landowner, there will never be an excavation no matter how good the artifacts or the, the, the archaeology is, you have to get the permission. So in terms of horizontal, as long as it's within the permission of the landowner, and if the, if you, the landowner agrees that you dig up 
uh, maybe some of them agree and then they say, oh, you have to fill it back, um, you know, um, backfill it. So we have to do it. So it doesn't matter if small or big, the landowner should give a permission. The second question is on, sorry, Mariana. The, cool. the, uh, the, the, first question? the, the family that was um, uh, next to yeah. yeah, in Guacapa. The core family, yes. I still remember. I mean, they are very cooperative. Uh, the first season where we excavated in 2010, uh, you know, they, they have a small orchard around the house. So every afternoon they will, you know, uh, give us jampada and anka, you know, to eat. They, they say whatever they want to do, you know, within the land, just dig. Okay. But don't just, yeah, just <laughs> don't dig inside our house. That's all. Oh, okay. You Fair know. food, just yeah. stay away. But, uh, but the, the issue is that the, the land doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the state government. So when they decided, when the state government decided to build up the gallery, you know, there was a bit of, uh, you know, conflict, but then it was settled. I mean, they got their uh, compensation and everything. And the skeletons that found, the number 42 skeletons, was actually underneath their house. So, you know. They, they are quite surprised of it. You know, they didn't, they, well, nobody knows that there used to be a skeleton under their house, but they are, yeah, they're very cooperative and so they're very happy. So if a landowner uh, discovers an artifact in their property, you know, must, while they're gardening or something like that, um, does it belong to the government? Uh, well, I'm not the right person to talk about Akta Warisan Kebangsaan and National Heritage Act. But one thing for sure, if you find something uh, within your land or property, uh, you know, uh, that you think that it could be artifacts or anything, the first thing that you should do is to report it to the authorities. Uh, you can report it to the district officer and then the district officer will report it to the National and Heritage Department. Okay. Yes. I hope that so, uh, satisfies your, um, your, uh, your, put the, your question uh, for the time being, Faisal. Um, and okay, so you know how there's so many people who who has always wanted to be an archaeologist. <laughs> Thank you, Indiana Jones. Uh, but but basically, people are have always are, are naturally attracted to the romance of archaeology. You know, you're all rugged out there, not stuck at a desk job. Uh, you know, you get all the sun. <laughs> you get. Well, to be honest, there's a lot of desk job you need to do before you can go out. Portrayed. As, uh, as such um, and and we have a few people here who obviously are interested in your in your job scope um, so one okay they're all asking how do you encourage people um, to, to pursue archaeology uh, are there training are there courses but before you answer that uh, <laughs> I'd like to know, as an archaeologist, you know, are there a lot of frustrations? <laughs> in <laughs> because people like the others were, you know, like it's a bit too late for us to change our profession. We want to know whether we made the right decision, <laughs> um, uh, you know, to take up anthropology or archaeology. So what's the real deal? And then you can answer the others, whether it's worth uh, signing up for a course. I think when it comes to the frustration, every every vocation got its own frustration, right? <laughs> well, I think uh, it's all about passion. And if you, I guess in any kind of profession, if you think that you are interested in doing it, then it becomes, uh, it's, it's not just vocation, but it's like a holiday. <laughs> every day you enjoy doing it. So um, in terms of whether it's worth it to pursue archaeology or not, I mean, if you are interested in, in, in knowing, in, in learning about the identity of yourself, as well as the nation, as well as the environment, then why not, you know, doing archaeology? Um, w one of the things that I want, to, I want to highlight as well, uh, I, I can see that people from other parts of Southeast Asia, Malaysia is the only country, or maybe not the only country, but one of the country, one of the develop, developing country in Southeast, Southeast Asia that doesn't have an undergraduate uh, for undergraduate degree in archaeology. None of our university actually offers undergraduate degree in archaeology. In USM, we only offer um, a minor program. So our students mostly coming in from 
different background, science, arts, and everything. And they did, they do their postgrads in archaeology. So uh, that that is also an advantage because you have people coming in from different background and uh, you know contributing different kind of uh, field uh, uh, ideas to the field of archaeology itself. Uh, so uh, I guess whether it's worth it or not, I mean, it's 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 up to you. And I think um, uh, in archaeology, it's all about having fun. I guess doing excavation is you know under the sun or under the rain. It's all about fun, and traveling is one of the perks as well. So if you like those kind of things, you know, uh, yeah, why not come yeah, so, and join us at USM? So Ash, um, apa tu Ashika and. I think it was Afzal. It's really about your passion, whether you believe in the profession. Otherwise, yeah. it's not worth pursuing, yeah. right? Another thing, yeah. Another thing is that you don't you don't have to become an archaeologist to appreciate archaeology. You know, um, mm -hmm. as long as you understand what it is, you can always ask. You know, people to you know. I I I believe in cooperation between different people from different fields, and that will make things much more interesting. Okay, we, we only have time for another two questions. So I'm going to uh, take one that is related to uh, your topic just now. This is from Jane Chan. Well, she asked, um, for, at Google, what exactly did the shelves? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the shelves, what? And also, um, Sia Boy oh, the shell is in ancient times. So what exactly the shell serve? Uh, actually, it's a it's food. It food remains. So you can actually see it becomes a midden because they eat a lot of shells during that time, and it's 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 purposely dumped at one area. And this is a culture not just in Malaysia but throughout the region, and even now still practice in some countries in 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 Africa like Senegal. So they they actually dump shells in certain places it's it's like a dumping site for shells so uh and uh, the, the 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 it was later utilized by 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 architects by cons uh contractor uh to use as a source of lime because in penang you don't have um uh, uh, a cave or cars lime cars so they they think that it's a suitable material to be used as a as a building material. So uh, I hope that answers the question. The second question is, the next question is- Yeah, but right? the ancient, ancient site, uh, uh, yeah. uh, during ancient times. Siaboy. Yeah, was it a the, ancient times? Um, I'm not sure whether we have, ex we have, well, based on our excavation, we haven't discovered up to that level, but based on uh, what uh, Mokhtar Saidin wrote, uh, there were several reports from, from Komta area, which is not far from Siabui, the discovery of Neolithic aces, uh, Neolithic stone tools from that area. So there could be a possibility that the whole area used to be, uh, there used to be a Neolithic settlement as well, you know, you, mm -hmm. one nobody might know about it unless if there's a proper survey and excavation okay well the last one uh, is how is the penang woman being conserved and kept after uh, the excavation what what have what's the penang woman doing right now <laughs> what what is she doing right now and where is she what no hold on rephrase what are you guys doing to the penang woman <laughs> <laughs> so the penang the penang well i i yeah, well, we we already call it the Penang woman uh, because, uh, yeah, well, basically, okay lah, the Penang woman lah. So GKH-17 is currently in USM, housed in USM. So uh, that's part of my PhD uh, uh, th uh, thesis, actually. So uh, we did the conservation uh, analysis as well, try to identify uh, more data about it, uh, you know, the stature and uh, part of my... Um, um, part of my research is trying to understand the diet of this skeleton uh, and how how uh, how she actually adapted to the environment during that time because there's no other data that I can access except uh, GKH-17. Okay. Well, um, that's the end of the Q&A session, but um, Shaiful, you can 
feel free to answer the other questions uh, in the chat box. Oh, yes. We have a bit of time. And to the others, all the attendees, I think that were about 67 of you. Um, thank you for attending. And we, I think we all should, you know, try our best to support the local archaeological industry and travel if we can have more series such as this one, perhaps like for every state, every project you've um, you've uh, carried out, you know, maybe the next segment could be just on um, Batu, Lengong, and Kuala Lumpur, Manitau, other yeah. And um, I think, um, yeah, because if we don't, we, if we don't promote this um, or promote the knowledge, can, um, we're, we're, we're at loss because we know so much about the rest of the world and it's quite embarrassing when we don't know um, about our own town, can, about Pulau Pinang, the biggest city of Komta, can, or did you know there's actually um, uh, ruins and stuff uh, underneath? Can know how embarrassing. Uh, but yes, I think knowledge is power, and then what you're doing is great. Keep up, and yeah, don't let uh, our stupid decisions uh, at present times uh, delete our past. That is something everyone should. <laughs> that should be our motto. Uh, so, um, Duncan, Duncan, where are you? Where I'm gonna pass the time back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana, and thanks to you, Shai Paul. What a Thank fascinating you. look at um, three very interesting sites in Penang and their their archaeology. So, really, thank you to you. Thank Our you. time thank is uh, pretty much up for tonight. So, as promised, I'd like to share with you some details of the course that we're jointly offering uh, between Think City and uh, Ecomos Malaysia. So, we have a two-part cultural heritage course that will be kicking off in um, just a few weeks. So the course, Cultural Heritage Dollars and Cents, is being sponsored by the City Foundation and is aimed at those city makers who have a professional interest in cultural heritage. And if you're aged below 35, that means you've got to be 35 or below on the 1st of January 2021. And you're based in Asia. You stand a very good chance of getting into this. So the first part of the course is going to be focused on culture, heritage and conservation. And our instructors from around the region will be looking at traditional knowledge, uh, building materials and heritage interpretation. And then the second module, which will be happening, happening a few weeks later in uh, towards the end of January uh, 2021, is on culture, heritage and economics. And we're going to be looking at heritage valuation, cultural mapping and also heritage versus development. Very tricky uh, question, that one, heritage against development. So. Does this sound like you, something that you're, you're interested in? Uh, we do have limited numbers. And so for those of you who are here in the webinar, um, you get a first opportunity to um, apply for this. And there will, is an application form that is now available. You should be able to see that. And there are no fees for this because this is being provided by the City Foundation. A big thank you to City Foundation for the very generous contribution to make this, this possible. Um, we will be announcing the course uh, to the general public on the 17th of December, so do take the opportunity to, to get in early. And the course will officially commence on the 2nd of January, but there will be an opportunity for you to get some early access to the materials if you're a bit bored over the Christmas New Year break. Um, to pass on the information to anyone that you think might be interested. And finally, we do have a short survey as well. So if you're not going to fill in the form, maybe you can help us improve our webinars by filling in the, the survey so we can improve the content as well as the, the format. So that's all from me. Thanks again to our speaker, Shifel, our lovely moderator, Mariana, and to Ecomos Malaysia for providing all this content. And finally, to City Foundation, without whom's generous uh, grant this wouldn't be possible and of course to everyone who joined us today uh, thank you so much I hope to see you again in the future and until next time everybody goodbye <laughs>